all a very important part of the Lord's ministry. Let's look at Revelation chapter 9. We are uh, working our way through the entire book of Revelation. It's been a blessing to us. And uh, we're picking up uh, chapter 9. The fifth angel is going to blow his trumpet. We're only going to look at one trumpet today. That one trumpet is a whole pericope all by itself. It's a message all by itself. But let's just keep in mind where we're coming from. The saints of this first century church here in Asia Minor are being persecuted by Rome and they're being forced to do things by their community that God said you cannot do. The main one in that first century Rome was bow and offer incense to our Lord and Savior, the emperor of Rome, Domitian at the time. Bow down to him and call him Lord. Bow down to him and call him God. Call him Savior. And obviously God, our God, Jehovah God, the God of Israel, is a jealous God. He's let us know that. And he says, you can't have any other gods before me. And so in that first century, you could be put to death for not being willing to bow down to the God of Rome. And so these poor Christians are suffering tremendously in this first century. And we saw at the beginning of chapter 8 that their prayers are going up to God. Their cries are going up to God. And there is an angel in heaven before the throne of God that is offering up incense and prayers of the saints. And the next thing we see happening there is that one of the angels goes and gets fire from the altar and throws this fire down on the earth. That fire coming on the earth is a judgment on the people that are oppressing God's children. And so now we've looked at the four first parts of that. We're going to look at the fifth idea. We're jumping right in the middle of God sending His judgment on the people that are oppressing His church. That would have been Rome at this time. So let's read through uh, this first little section, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. This will be the fifth angel gets ready to blow his trumpet. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star on the earth that had fallen from the heavens. And there was given to him a key, a key to the shaft of the abyss. And he opened the shaft of the abyss, and out came smoke from the shaft. This smoke was like the smoke of a great, enormous furnace. And the sun and the air became completely dark from the smoke that rose up out of the shaft. <clears throat> And from the smoke came locusts onto the earth, and it was given to them this power that was like the power that scorpions have on the earth. And these locusts, they were, they were told not to harm or to damage any of the hortong, any of the grass, also, not any of the chlorong, green vegetation, and also not any of the dendrong, the trees. You're not allowed to hurt the grass, the green vegetation, or the trees, except those men, the ones that do not have the seal of God upon their foreheads. And it was given to them that they could not kill any of them, but they could only afflict them. They could only torment or test these men for five months. This affliction, this testing, this torment was similar to, was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. 
And in those days, they will seek, those men will seek death, and they will, ume, certainly not find it. They will desire to die, but death will flee from them, death will elude them. The likeness of these locusts was like, similar to horses that have been made ready for battle. And upon their heads was something like golden crowns. The faces of them were something like the faces of men. They had hair that was like women's hair. And their odontes, orthodontics is our word from there. Their teeth were something like lion's teeth. And they had their thorax, thoracas, their thorax was a breastplate. It looked like a breastplate made of iron. The sound of their wings was something like the sound of chariots of war and many, many horses running into battle. And they had tails that were similar to scorpions' tails. And in their tails was the power to torment the men for five months. These have as their king the angel of the abyss. His name in the Hebrew is Abaddon. His name in the Greek is Apolluon. Apollyon, Apollyon, the destroyer. The first woe has passed. It is now complete. Behold, there is coming the second woe after this. The fifth angel that blows his trumpet is also the first woe. We already talked about it as we are looking at these groups of seven in Revelation. These groups of seven, seven trumpets, seven seals, uh, seven bowls, are divided into two groups within the seven, a group of four and a group of three. The group of four trumpets we saw last week, and it was judgments on the earth. A third of the earth was burned, a third of the trees were burned in last week's sermon. All of the green grass was burned, a third of the seas, a third of the ships and all the clean drinking water, and we looked at that last week. This is talking about destroying the commerce of Rome. Those first four trumpets were announcing God was raising up these things to destroy the commerce of Rome, and this would be the eventual downfall of this Roman kingdom that was oppressing this brand new kingdom that had been set up during their time. The prophet Daniel told us, told them that that's what would happen. King Nebuchadnezzar was the first king of a kingdom. Then would come uh, the Medes and the Persians. Then would come the Greeks. And then would come Rome. And he says during the time of that fourth empire, during the time of that Roman empire, God is going to set up a kingdom. And it will destroy the other kingdom. It will become a huge mountain. That is Christianity, that is the kingdom of heaven on earth, that is what Jesus set up, and this Christian kingdom was going to destroy this Roman kingdom, is what Daniel told us. So he uses that imaginary, that uh, picturesque, apocalyptic language to talk about the economic destruction of Rome, and it finally fell in 476 A.D., <clears throat> and now we're getting into the, the group of three, the last three trumpets, and actually this fifth trumpet is one all by itself. The economy of Rome had fallen. Let me look at this uh, first verse. And then I saw a star on the earth which had fallen from the heavens, and it was given to him the keys to the shaft of the abyss. Something uh, here, the difference between a verb and an adjective is an interesting difference in the text. 
Here, this idea of having fallen is a participle. It's an adjective. And so what John is shown here is this, the sun, the moon, and the stars. We've got to remember that this language, this uh, old time language, sun, moon, and stars were always uh, hierarchies of some kind. When we look at Joseph's dream, in Joseph's dream, his dad was the sun, his mother was the moon, his brothers were the stars, and they all bowed down to him. Uh, when God is going to destroy a kingdom, the sun and the moon are going to go dark, the, fall, the stars are going to fall from the skies. So these are hierarchies. And so one of these stars, some kind of a hierarchy, he sees it on earth, but he uses this uh, participle, uh, an adjective, it says it, it, it fell from heaven. So this is a being that is at one time exalted, at one time a heavenly being, and he's now seeing it on earth. <clears throat> uh, in chapter 8 and verse 10, uh, we see this idea of fallen using as a verb. So it's different. He said, and I saw a star fall from the sky. So that's kind of interesting to me. Two differences. I saw a star fall from the sky to the earth. That's in chapter 8 and verse 10. Here, he sees a star that's on the earth, that had fallen from the sky. And he was given the keys to the shaft of the abyss. The abyss, uh, we'd have to understand this first century idea. Hades was the typical place amongst the Greek where dead souls go to wait. Typically thought of under the ground, you can read it in Homer. It's just a typical Greek phrase. Hades is this place under the earth where all the dead are kind of hanging out. The idea of the abyss, the idea of the abyss is supposed to inspire shock and awe and terror. In Genesis chapter 1, the Spirit of God was hovering over the ocean, over the deep of the ocean, and the word there is abuso, the abyss. So the ocean is called an abyss. So it's this deep, profound, scary, terrifying place. So he's using this Greek understanding of this abyss, and he's saying this individual that was on earth that had fallen from heaven has this key to open this gate to this terrifying place, this shaft that leads down to the abyss. And the understanding was in this abyss lurked all of the terrifying, evil, scary things. Demons, monsters. <clears throat> and so this first century early mind would have understood that. In verse 2 here, he opened this shaft to the abyss and out from it came smoke out of the shaft. The smoke was like, he's trying to give you an analogy of what it looked like. This is not what he saw. This is what he's trying to explain, what it looked like. It looked like the smoke coming out of a great big furnace. I'm sure they would have known what that was in those days. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were going to be thrown into a gigantic furnace that was heated up. So that must have had special connotation for them. About the best idea of smoke I can imagine is when you open a Traeger. That's about as creative as I can get. Although, when we had dinner with uh, Curtis's family, you could look over at the Hanford site. There's a bunch of smoke coming out from over there. So it's almost smoke that was rising from the Hanford plumes or whatever, you know. That was what he was doing. He was giving them a, a familiar sight, okay? Familiar sight. So here is a scary image the smoke rising up out of this shaft where all the scary demons are lurking. He's developing this idea, and he's going to build on it, the darkness of the smoke. He's using some mnemonic devices. Today we might, when we hear the song, Ain't no sunshine when she's gone. That creates a, a certain feeling, right? There's sadness, there's gloom. We got any CCR fans? The song might be, uh, and I wonder, still I wonder, who'll stop the rain? Those are our more modern day ideas of gloom and sadness and despair. Okay, so that's what he's painting a picture of this. Gloom, sadness, and despair is going to come on certain individuals of the earth who are persecuting his saints. Verse 3. He's going to add to the picture now the smoke that came out of this shaft 
All of these locusts. Steve, you might be getting ready. Close. All of these locusts came out of the smoke and onto the earth. And it was given to them power. And they had the power that was like scorpion stings. We have to understand in the, in the uh, first thousand years of the previous, uh, what do we call it? Before Christ. Snakes, generations. Snakes and scorpions were the common fear of mankind. You're walking through a desert. Some of you that hike Badger Mountain, maybe you're afraid of rattlesnakes, right? So we feel a little tinge of that. Snakes and scorpions were the big terror of mankind. So he's just saying there's this horrible thing that's coming up that's going to be a terror to men. And here's how to kind of familiar yourself with that terror, the same way that you're afraid of walking through the desert because of rattlesnakes and scorpions. That's the way these men are going to feel. He's painting an image for them. Um... This ominous scene of locusts, we see it first in Exodus, one of the plagues that came over the land, and it's terrifying when we read that. Exodus chapter 10, verse 13. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. And the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all day and all night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a, death, a dense swarm of locusts has never before seen or never will be seen again. If I have any Bible readers, I'd like for you to help me out. This phrase, it has never been seen before and it will never be seen again. If you guys want to help me out, keep track of that phrase anytime you see it in your Bibles because I'm trying to do some work on that phrase. But uh, for now... Verse 15, they covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened. How thick would this locust cloud have had to have been? The whole land was darkened and they ate all of the plants, all of the fruit trees, all of the hail. Not a green thing remained behind, neither tree nor plant nor field throughout all the land of Egypt. In their generation, locust was a terrifying thing and it could mean the exhausting of your food source in just a matter of days. Terrifying image for these people. Notice that the locust ate everything that was green, but our locusts here in Revelation are told, don't eat anything that's green. Don't affect any of the trees. Don't affect any of the grass. So he's painting a slightly different picture. Now you might think... Anybody ever seen a locust? Who knows what locusts are? I think you have to live in the south to know what locusts are. They, they sing you to sleep at night. It's got to be wet and it's got to be green. Or they keep you up at night, one of the two. How scary could a little cricket be, right? Well, I thought I'd help you out a little bit in case your imagination isn't good enough. Let's see, Steve, can we play a little scene here? Okay, I was hoping I didn't make anybody cry with that. Sitting here watching it, that seemed a lot longer than when I played it at home. Anyway, uh, I'm sure that's not what it looked like, but there's a locust scene for you in case you didn't have the imagination to wonder what in the world would be so terrifying about a little old locust. Well, when the sky is black with them, I'm sure it would be quite a much bigger deal. So he's using these locusts to paint an image in the minds of the first century church that is being oppressed. And we're going to get on with the text here and see what is the purpose of this. Uh, verse 4 in our text. And they were told not to harm. Oh, no, no, no. We did that, didn't we? Did we do verse 4? They were told not to harm or damage the grass. None of the green, green vegetation. Do not harm any of the dendron, any of the trees. Only the men who do not have the seal of God upon their forehead. So amidst this terrifying scene, there is comfort being brought to the church. Because he said, this is the judgment that's going to come on those people that are not my children, but rather the rebellious ones who are oppressing my children. So none of you would be any of those guys in that scene there. But he's telling the church God is going to bring judgment on the people that are oppressing them. Uh, just a quick side note. I've told you that Revelation is not chronological. 
And that's a big deal uh, in people that study. They want to say that you know, Revelation is chronological. It gets us right up to Judgment Day. But you'll remember the sixth seal was already Judgment Day. With the seven trumpets, we started over. Uh, even here within the seven trumpets, the seven trumpets are not chronological events. Because if you'll remember, uh, <clears throat> I think I gave you this. Yeah, one of the first trumpets, let's look at that, chapter 8, Revelation chapter 8. Oh, I put verse 7, I hope that's right. With this trumpet, a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the green grass was burned up. So if all the green grass was burned up during this, you know what, I'm drawing a blank. I don't remember if this is the first trumpet or the third trumpet, but if all the green grass was burned up by the third trumpet, and then here at the fifth trumpet, he's saying, don't harm any of the green vegetation, don't eat any of the grass. It's important that we realize Revelation is just a, a layering on of metaphors, of ideas that a persecuted people could use. And in this particular case, it happens to be locusts, the devastation that locusts could create, kind of like a seven-layer cake. Uh, you need all the layers in order to create this big picture. So it's just a, a bunch of metaphors and pictures to help comfort the church to say God is going to do something about the evil people that are persecuting you. This idea that those who do not have the seal of God, we looked at that in a previous scripture, but I want to give it to you again. He gets this idea of being sealed from the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 9 this isn't some kind of a physical mark that we're going to see on people. But it's the idea of distinguishing between the common and the holy. A priest is supposed to distinguish between what is good and what is evil. And so these people that are marked with the sign of God on their forehead are the people that have learned to distinguish between what is good and what is evil. Having learned to distinguish between what is good and what is evil, we love that which is good. And we hate that which is evil. That's what God gives us in the life of a repentant Christian. And so let's look at the, where he gets this idea of marking God's children. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 3 He's going to bring a judgment on Israel because Israel is doing some very, very wicked things in the dark. He shows Ezekiel the things that Israel does in the dark, and they are abominations before God. He says, I'm going to have to do something about this. I'm going to bring judgment on Israel, but before I bring judgment, I'm going to seal the people that hate what's going on in Israel. I'm going to protect the people that can't stand the abominations that are happening. Verse 3, and he called to the man that was clothed in linen who had the writing case at his waist. The Lord said to him, pass through the city, go throughout Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and groan over all the abominations that are being committed in Israel. I want you to go mark my people that are suffering because of all the impurity and immorality and debauchery that is happening in their community. The people that are grieved by this because they're holy. They know that their God hates it, so they hate it too. I want you to go mark those people first. We're going to protect those people. Verse 5. Then to the others he said, within my hearing, these are the ones with the weapons of destruction following behind this guy, that's marking the people. It says, Now tell them to pass through the city after you. Their eyes shall not spare, and they shall show no pity. They're to kill the old men outright, young men and maidens, little children and women, but touch no one on whom is the mark. Doesn't that sound very familiar? These locusts are given power and authority to go throughout judgments, but touch no one on who has the mark. Similar parallel to Ezekiel. Verse 5 of Revelation. And it was given to them that they could not kill 
anybody. They could only afflict them for five months. The affliction or the torment was like the torment of a scorpion sting. I want you to see if you can dig back in your own Old Testament memory. Can you ever remember somebody appearing before God? And God says, what do you think of my servant? God in his pride and his love and his zeal for his good servant. There you go. And he says to Satan, yeah, he's only good because you're good to him. He only loves you because you've made him wealthy. He only loves you because he, you've made him comfortable. God says, no, I think his love is deeper than that. So here's the deal, Satan. You can afflict him. It's our word here. You can afflict him, but you cannot kill him. That should jump to our memory. You can afflict him, but you cannot kill him because my righteous people only get better under affliction. They only get better when the heat is turned up and all the dross and impurity gets melted out of the pot. The pot only gets purer. The pot only gets more holy. So Satan, you can afflict him, but you can't kill him. And that's what we see in these locusts. You're allowed to go afflict the people, but you're not allowed to kill them. For five months, what's the deal with five months? A lot of people want to take Revelation very literally. Hopefully we've seen that all of Revelation throws us back to images in the Old Testament and we want to make those parallels. Why can you only afflict them for five months? I'm sure somebody will come up with a war that took five months. Somebody will come up with something. But here's the reality. Locusts are the focus of the uh, mnemonic device, if that's what you want to call it. This image that he is planting in their mind to show them that God is going to do something. Here's something interesting about locusts. A.T. Robertson is a foremost uh, Greek scholar on the text. And he says, the actual locust is born in the spring, dies at the end of summer. An actual locust lives for about five months. Just in case, I use Wikipedia, make sure everything's legit. Look up desert locusts. In Wikipedia, here's what you get. The desert locust lives a total of about three to five months, although this is extremely variable, depends mostly on weather, ecological seasons. So he's using this five months in keeping with the analogy of the locust is when I send these locusts, there's a time when it's going to start and there's a time when it's going to stop. This affliction is going to have a season. That's the idea. It's going to be a partial judgment. It's going to have a season. I know when it's going to start. I know when it's going to stop. <clears throat> God has a season for bringing judgment on those that are dead set against His will, His commandments, dead set against holiness, and dead set against those people that have been made holy and sanctified. Verse 6 of our text here, And in those days... Those ones, those people, those men that are being afflicted. Something similar to what Job experienced. In those days, they're going to wish they could die. They're going to seek out death, but death is going to elude them and flee from them. I'll tell you, unfortunately, when we read that, we don't get any idea of what that's trying to say. When I read that, you start getting it. Man, when in the world would a man choose to die? Uh, when would an affliction be so horrible that someone would seek out death? The only place my mind could go was uh, 1929, right? Stock market crashed, and some people lost so much money that they couldn't start over, and people were jumping off buildings, and that was a bad time for America. So that was the only place I could go in my mind. A tragic event that was so horrendous in the life of some people, they, they couldn't... They couldn't uh, deal with it, and so they sought death. Uh, I'm not saying that this was 1929. I'm saying that's the only thing that popped into my mind. But we miss, we miss. This is a lamentation. This is a lamentation. 
So let me give it back to you. And then let's read, how did Job feel when Job was being afflicted? What was Job's lamentation? And I want you to pay attention to the language in Revelation and the language that Joel uses. A lot of darkness, a lot of wish I was never born, a lot of wish I could die. But this is not suicide. It's a lamentation. It's a sense of sorrow because of the anguish that I'm in. Okay? That's the picture it should paint. So, verse 6 of our revelation, they will seek death, but they will not be able to find it. They will desire to die, but death will flee from them. And let's look at Job's lamentation. This is a woe, a sadness of a person. Job chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, um, Job has been afflicted because God allowed Satan to do that, even though he was righteous, to show that the afflictions of this life cannot deter a righteous person from his righteousness. So look for darkness and cursing birth and all that type of language here. Job opened his mouth and he cursed the day of his birth. Job said, let the day perish on which I was born and the night when a man was conceived. Let the day become complete darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine on it. Let gloom and deepest darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell on it. Let the blackness of day terrify it. That night, let it be thick darkness. Seize it. Let there be no rejoicing in that year and that month. Verse 20. Why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the ones that are bitter in their soul who long for death, but it never comes. You see the parallels? They dig for it more than for hidden treasure. They rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they finally find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? My sighing comes instead of my bread. My groanings are poured out like water. The thing that I fear most comes upon me and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease nor am I quiet. I have no rest. And so, at risk of sounding doom and gloom and sad, let's, let's make sure that we remember the context of what's happening here. Saints in the province of Asia Minor, a Roman province, are being persecuted by Rome and other sources. Struggling financially, they can be taken to court and they can be sued and stripped of all their possessions. Being afflicted, they're praying out to God to help them in this moment of agony. And God hears their prayer and says, I'm going to send down a fire on the earth. He's comforting the church. He says, And he gives this idea of comfort in this particular example, the form of these terrifying locusts that are going to wreak havoc on the people that are persecuting you. Church doesn't need to be afraid of any of this. It was that first century church being comforted. I'm going to bring down an agony and a discomfort on the people that are persecuting you. The people that don't love righteousness, and so they persecute the righteous. The people that don't love holiness, and so they persecute the holy. The people who don't worship me, and so they persecute those that do what it's going to look like, and he gave them this vision. The metaphor. It's completed in verse 6 there. The whole analogy, the whole mnemonic device, it's completed by verse 6. And so you say, well, what about verses 7 through 12? We're only halfway there. Luckily for you, we're going to stop there because we're out of time, but we're only halfway there. It's interesting about 7 through 12. 7 through 12 just paints a more grisly picture of the locusts. Talks about what the locusts look like, what their teeth look like, what their chests look like. And uh, there's something about just, I think he's giving them a mnemonic device. Can you imagine, after God destroyed the earth by the flood, he gave the world a mnemonic device, a symbol, so that every time we see that symbol, we're reminded of God's love for us. 
And God said, I'll never ever destroy the world by a flood again. All we have to do is see a rainbow in the sky and all the illusions of the flood and Noah and Noah's preaching and righteousness and unrighteousness and the door being shut on people banging to get in. He said, it's too late. You should have got in when I told you to get in. All these visions are created just by a mnemonic device, seeing a rainbow. That's exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing for this first century church. Next time you guys see a locust or a grasshopper, that grasshopper is a mnemonic device for this first century. When your children go out and catch their grasshoppers and bring them home and you're looking at them, you can talk about what looks like a crown of gold on their head. Look at that grasshopper and say, what looks like a, a chest plate of bronze what looks like a little miniature horse. And every time a kid comes home with a locust, they can reflect on God's judgment on evil people and his protection of the good people, those ones that he loved. It's a mnemonic device for something that I'm sure they saw all the time. It gave people an opportunity to tell a story every time their kids brought in a grasshopper or a locust to sit down and have a conversation about God and his love towards the righteous, and his wrath towards the wicked. In closing, I probably don't need another locust story. I'm terrified enough as it is, but I, I got one here. Joel, when Joel is telling Israel, you need to quit being wicked. You need to quit being evil, because God is sending a day that's going to come like a locust invasion. What we know from this reading of Joel Locusts had already come through Israel and damaged all the crops. So they were already in a real bad way. So Joel prophesies another locust invasion, but this time he's using locusts as a metaphor for the Assyrian armies that are going to come in and destroy. They're going to blacken the, uh, the hills of Jerusalem. There's going to be so many of them. So he's warning Israel, you better change your act you better love what is holy and hate what is good because this is what the Lord is bringing and he uses this locust invasion. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Oh, Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm of my holy mountain. Let the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and darkness like the blackness is spread on the mountains and the great power of people. Their like has never been before and will never be again after them. Oh, that's twice already. The years of their generation, the fire devours before them and it leaves behind them everything burnt. The land is like the Garden of Eden before, but after it is a desolate wilderness. Nothing will escape. The appearance is like the appearance of wild horses, war horses when they run, the rumbling of chariots, the flames of fire devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawing up for battle before the people are in anguish and their faces grow pale. The fifth trumpet gives us, gives that first century church a, another mnemonic device, this grasshopper, to comfort the church about what God will do to stop the people that are persecuting them. If we trace back through Revelation, the mnemonic devices we've had so far, we've seen the horses that are going out covering the land. It means God knows what is happening on the land. We've seen mountains on fire. That was a mnemonic device for God tearing down kingdoms. And here, this new image, there was an angel that had been fallen from heaven. He had keys to this terrifying abyss. Dark, ominous smoke comes out of the abyss. The locusts come out of the abyss. And this is supposed to remind people the plagues that came on Egypt. The plagues of the locusts that Joel described. The suffering and the anguish that fell on Job. And the lamentations <clears throat> that follow. The message to the church was love God, love His commandments, and live holy. Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 4 Pass through the city, put a mark on the foreheads of the men that sigh and groan over all the abominations that they are witnessing. That was to the first century church. 
this uh, differentiation, there's a clear differentiation we're seeing in black and white, guys. Judgment and wrath is coming on those that do not love God, do not love His Word, love the abominations of the community that is around them. But there is a seal that's been put on His church. Those people that anguish at the abominations that are going on in your community. Those people that are tormented by the things that you know God hates that we see happening in the community. When there is injustices that happen, when the poor are being oppressed, when you see the mounting homelessness in Seattle, Los Angeles, that the local authorities won't do anything to fix. When you see a man dressing like a woman, when we see boys pretending to be girls, when we witness drunkenness and the exaltation of drunkenness and partying, sexual immorality, when we see those in our community, there's a difference between who is marked and preserved by God and who God's wrath is on. The ones that are mortified by the abominations that we're seeing are God's children. <clears throat> the ones that sigh and moan at the abominations that are happening in the community are God's children. The ones that love and long for that stuff that God calls an abomination have got this plague of locusts that like Job will have them wishing for death. Last verse, and we'll call it good. Nope, not that one. 1 Samuel chapter 2. It's an important uh, idea that God gives us here. Eli was one of the priests. Eli was one of the priests of Israel, and God had told him, Eli, you and your family will be priests forever. But then Eli's children are priests, and they become sexually immoral. And they begin not offering God the best sacrifices and keeping those sacrifices for themselves. Eli's children become depraved. And the thing is, Eli is not strong enough to stop his children from their depravity. So God says, Eli, because you have exalted your children above my commandments... Remember that promise that I made that you and your family would always be priests? Yeah, not anymore. Not anymore, Eli, because you didn't choose to obey my commandments. So here's the story that God tells Eli. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that members of your family would minister before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me God tells Eli, the deal is off, Eli, because I will honor the people that honor me. I will love those people that love me. I will rain down blessings and patience and grace on people that love me. I will honor the ones that love me. But the people that despise me, the people that despise my children, the people that despise my words, I will loathe those people. <clears throat> I feel like saying Mufasa. Well, that's a tough message, guys. Not a fun one. But I do rejoice that God has exceedingly, abundantly, more than all you could ask or imagine. Good things for those that would love him. Exceedingly, abundantly, more than all you could ask or imagine because God loves his people. But let's not make the mistake of misleading anybody. 
God honors the people that honor Him and loathes the people that loathe Him. Amen. Heavenly Father, we've looked at Your Scripture, not the easiest message in the world, but Father, we rejoice to know that it is easy enough to come into Your grace and Your love. It is easy enough, Father, You have said, return to Me, and I will return to You. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy and your patience in our life. Father, it's a desire of Westside Church to proclaim your truth, to show your love and your honor to the community around us that they might honor you too, Father, that they could be snatched from the fire. Father, we want to help our communities honor you and love what you love and hate what you hate so that you will lavish them in blessings and your love. We want our community to experience that. But Father, we can't hide the other reality that you also have said, if you choose not to honor me, choose not to love me, I will think very little of you. Thank you for your mercy in our life, Father, your goodness. You are awesome. You are greater and larger than anything we could imagine. We lift up your name and we praise your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.